That's adorable. Yeah. This is Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me tonight. Okay, so back doing a live today. Really, really excited about that. Let me go ahead and pull up the chats, uh, just kind of letting some notif uh, notifications get sent out. Um, if you haven't, uh, if you can hit that like button, uh, word on the street is that should help send out notifications so that people can uh, tune in and check out what I have to say tonight. <clears throat> um, uh, lots of people saying hi in the chat. Uh, hi to everybody. As I get more efficient at this, I'll probably uh, start saying hi specifically to some of you, but I do very much appreciate that you are all here. Okay, so what am I talking about tonight? So uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of history from me when I was working for the Church of Scientology. When I was working at international management and when I was probably in my early 20s. Um, yeah, probably 20, somewhere between 20 and probably 21, 22 years old. Uh, for those who don't know, I was, um, I, I was, uh, recruited into the C organization with my mother, if you want to call it that. I was uh, about 10 years old when my mother uh, brought us out to the C organization and I was put in to their cadet organization. And eventually that was in Los Angeles. And eventually we were moved up to a place I refer to as the International Ranch. It's close to Golden Era Productions or the Int Base. And I'm going to do some graphics and show people that here in a minute. And uh, when I was about 15 years old, um, I wanted to leave. I wanted to not be there anymore. And um, I ended up um, being made to stay. I was isolated from the other kids. And over the course of several um, years of kind of uh, what they refer to as security checking, kind of reindoctrination, I decided to stay in the organization um, by the time I was just short of my 18th birthday. So I'm <clears throat> um, just trying to kind of frame ev uh, this for everybody so they get a little bit of my history. I know there's probably some people that aren't as familiar with my story. So um, putting it there for you. And then also for those who are uh, are a little bit more familiar with it. Thanks for listening to it again. All right. So what did I do uh, in the organization uh, once I kind of decided to dedicate myself to it? I tried to go all in. I tried to do as good as I can. I tried to be a full member of this organization. Now, um, something that is very uh, probably important to highlight you have religions and a lot of, uh, and then you have high control groups, you have cults, and then you have extremist religious groups. So in my estimation, extremist religious groups and cults tend to act the same way. It is kind of an all or nothing approach. You're 100% and there's no middle ground. There's no margin for kind of self thought. And I think that that's probably, probably where religion kind of ends up um, moving over into a, a cult is when it kind of brings on all these different behavior, um, control, thought control, information, etc. Uh, a great book on this for those who aren't familiar, uh, Dr. Uh, Stephen Hassan um, has a, a, his um, ap absolutely uh, pivotal book, uh, Combating Cult Mind Control. I'd highly recommend it for anyone that just wants to know more about it. It even applies to crappy relationships and everything else. Anyway, so as I'm going to show you tonight, I was involved in very much uh, with this organization. And at the time of this, I was working at Golden Era Productions. This is kind of once I'm kind of put back into the fold. And I was actually working for the commanding officer of Golden Era Productions as his, what they refer to as an organizational officer. It's almost like an executive assistant that's job is to get work done that is ordered into the org. One of those functions was to take the orders that David Miscavige was sending into the organization. And I would go around the organization and try to get compliance on those, seeing if people understood what the orders were and then seeing how long it's going to take to do that and then reporting back up to RTC. Shortly after <clears throat> this video, probably within the year, I was then moved into a, a trainee pool to actually become a member of RTC, of which uh, they ended up um, sending me back to Golden Era Productions, and that's a whole separate story. But just to kind of frame ev uh, for everybody, I was a very trusted member of this organization uh, during the time of this incident that I'm going to talk about tonight. Okay, so what are we going to talk about? Let's talk about uh, Scientology, uh, uh, their entry-level organizations known as Class 5 organizations. These are the organizations that are staffed by civilian Scientologists. They might have um, a separate job or a separate source of income or a spouse that makes uh, other income, and then they work at these organizations. Um, this one in particular that we're going to be talking about, a lady named, uh, lady named Vipka Hansen, um, was the executive director of Hamburg Org. So she was in Hamburg. It was um, 
and the, these same organizations are like the ones that you're going to find in Tampa, in um, uh, Denver, uh, in Salt Lake City. So think, I don't know if they actually have one in Salt Lake City. That's a, uh, probably the Mormons have the uh, the <clears throat> the control of that place. But as you have these in, uh, in the larger cities, you're going to that's going to be the entry point where they're delivering um, basic entry level um, and um, up to a certain point prior to uh, the state of clear auditing and training for the members that get involved in Scientology, and then they kind of funnel up to the more advanced levels. So Vipka um, was a, uh, a staff member in Hamburg Org. Now, all of these organizations that I think there's been a lot of videos about these, they're, they're becoming small and failing. David Miscavige has this whole strategy to try to, you know, make these ideal organizations, retrain their people um, that are the executive crews in these, send them back out. And then miraculously, people are just going to start flowing in their doors and they're going to uh, expand like never before. <clears throat> okay, great. Well, um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. And there's uh, a lot of protesting that's starting to happen. So it's probably going to be kind of problematic for them. So we'll see. Um, there's going to be a lot to talk about as the time goes on. So going back to Vipka. <clears throat> all of these organizations, Hamburg, um, all internationally, they play this game every year called the birthday game. The birthday game is uh, sort of a game that they play in order to, uh, L. Ron Hubbard was asked a question once what he wants for his birthday. And he said, I would like organizations to uh, 5.4x their statistics. Um, and at that point, they decided to say, OK, well, we're going to make this a big game for everybody. And everyone got on board and they all were you know, doing great. And this whole thing was like a big deal. Hey, the birthday game. I don't, he picked, I guess, 5.4 as the number because I guess 5.3 was already taken. Um, I have no idea why. It's just this, like all the sort of weird crap that Scientology does. So every year, the idea is you play this game and you try to get your statistics up. Now, even a small organization, if they have the five point, you know, if they're if they're trying to expand and their rate of expansion is larger than a bigger organization that might be ultimately making more money, they are still expanding at a higher rate and they can still play this game and win it. So for several years prior to uh, 1995, Hamburg Org was winning this birthday game internationally. And Vipka Hansen would go up on stage uh, at the big event that they have for L. Ron Hubbard's birthday on March 13th every year. And she would receive these trophies about how amazing Hamburg Org was doing. And then all of a sudden in 1995, Vipka disappears. No one knew where she went. Um, her family didn't know where she went. And poof, she's gone. Um, I'll tell you where she went here in a minute. Another thing that was going on within Scientology is the German government was very not into Scientology's uh, shenanigans, and they were not uh, supportive of Scientology in their countries, and they were kind of pushing them out and, and you know, um, starting to take action against them for human rights violations. And us as Scientologists and as CIRG members, the kind of the narrative that we were being fed was Germans equal Nazis, German government is bad. Um, all of the stuff that the Germans do in the German media is tied into the psychiatrists. And there was this like narrative that we'd have in our minds about like this, these kind of concentration camps, high control, like Germans being bad, like executives that might've owned BMWs were made to sell their BMWs, even though Dave eventually bought a nice BMW seven series. Anyway, it was crazy at the time. So in our minds, German media and the German government we're very, very um, positioned as the enemy. So that's going to be important. So you kind of see some of the mindset. Along with that, you'll see that at the time I was a 100% believer. This is where you have the extremist views where individual safety doesn't matter and the things that you are doing for the group outweigh anything else. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to show you a couple um, clips of different videos and I'm going to kind of take you on a little tour and kind of frame this all for you. Um, the first thing that I'm going to bring up here is going to be um, the the beginning part of the documentary that was done by a gentleman named uh, Peter uh, Reichelt. And uh, I think his uh, co-producer on this was Ina Brockman. These two did a whole documentary. I have the documentary in its uh, entirety. It should be in the description below if you'd like to go on that and actually take a full look at it because we're not going to cover the whole thing. And also in there, I have the uh, the expanded 
uh, part where my interaction is, uh, we go into greater detail on that. I have been emailing back and forth now that I've started doing this with Peter, and it's been interesting to have some of the conversations because he was very much in the dark about it and still has a lot of questions, even though this is something that came out in 1999. So uh, let's get into this and uh, see how it goes. Once I do start this, if you can just let me know in the chat that you can definitely hear the sound, I would very much appreciate it. Let me go ahead and throw this up on the stage. And here we go. Hamburg, November 1995. With the missing persons complaint, German authorities are searching for the president of Scientology in Germany. In May 1995, 51-year-old Wiebke H. was suddenly relieved of her post. The investigative authorities in Germany believe she was placed in a Scientology prison camp in California. The Scientology organization asserts that the missing woman is dedicating herself to spiritual advancement. I called up the Scientologist and said, where is my sister? I read here in the newspaper that she is missing. I knew enough people there and so I called them up. At first they gave me a little bit of the run around, then I told them, out with it, give me the number, otherwise I'll raise a scene here. That is what I did, and as a matter of fact, Wiebke called back two days later. And after she heard that there was a missing persons complaint out on her, she went to the consulate in Los Angeles and that killed the matter. The police never came back here because she's not missing. According to the way we gauge things, she's under certain conditions at certain places, since I would probably not go there. Okay, so we have set the stage now at this point. This is uh, this is good time. So why was it that Vipka was disappeared? Why was it that she was like drug away and all of a sudden disappeared and then everyone's trying to find her? You can hear her brother talking about like, I tried to say that she was missing. And then they even had her call in and say, nope, I'm good. I'm just out here in California. So there's a lot to this. And she was obviously under the control of this organization. This is what was going on. And anyone that's followed the, the Scientology, the ex-Scientology universe, you will know that Scientology does these big events. And when they do these big events, they are sitting here saying about how amazing they're doing, how their statistics are high. They show all these, you know, you know, uh, performed uh, performances of their, their high statistics that are being shown to all their parishioners to try to keep them going and kind of buying into it. During this birthday game that these organizations were playing, apparently what happened is Vipka was falsifying these statistics that she would send up to international management for years. So all of the, the amount of people that were in the organization, the amount of money the organization was making, all of these, she had like two sets of books. There was the ones she would send up. So she would get like win the birthday game and be kind of the celebrity status in Scientology. And then there was the real ones that were, they weren't making nearly as much profit, nearly as much progress. And she were, she was keeping these books separate. So the way Scientology found out about this, the upper level management, is when the money that was coming up to, they have this thing called payments to flag, meaning a certain portion of everything that these class five orgs make, they have to send up to international management. Well, there started to be discrepancies as people were kind of like checking the numbers and like, wait, they were, they were probably trying to send the right amount of money up, but when you don't have enough money, it's kind of hard to send it up. So they looked into it and they found out that they were completely and totally full of crap. It was 100% a lie. And when this happened, um, th meanwhile, they had been like trotting her out at all these international events. And, um, and then they found out that this woman and her staff were all like lying. So what they did is they snatched her out of there and they sent a special mission to go and like fix Hamburg. And these executives apparently were not allowed to come back to international management until they re like they actually fixed Hamburg to where it had a lot of people coming in and the statistics were closer to what the actual thing was. So uh, most of that we're not going to get into. And I don't know all of those specifics because I wasn't on those international management lines, but this is what happened. So Vipka realized she was a civilian staff member at this class five organization. She was not 
not a member of the C organization. Okay. So when this happened, international management ordered most likely by David Miscavige or whoever was in charge of this thing. I, I don't know who exactly did, but it would have to come from the highest levels to do this. They took her and moved her to the international base. This is the one in Gilman Hot Springs. And then they they basically told her, you're going to go on to the rehabilitation project force. This is the Scientology C organization gulag thought reconditioning camp that they have. This is unheard of. That doesn't happen. She was not even a C org member. She was like, she was a, a German citizen that they moved into the United States and sent to this camp. So the little bit of, um, footage that you saw right there when all of the, like, you know, the really cool eighties music was playing, that was, you know, really exciting and all that, that is the location of that, um, that place where she was being kept. I'll pull it up here again. This was what, uh, the actual location of the international base rehabilitation project force in this Valley right here. Now I'm going to give you a little tour of what is actually going on in this place. So let me pull up my Google earth here and we're going to start back here at back in Hollywood, Hollywood, California, over here in Los Angeles. Again, I'll just show everybody for those that haven't been on one of my Google earth tours, how small Scientology actually is this the greater Los Angeles area all it is huge so if we zoom in on this you'll probably notice some very familiar buildings this is the area around L. Ron Hubbard way where a lot of the protesting has been going on and you can kind of see that here all right this is um this is where uh the the actual organizations that deliver Scientology in LA are a short distance from here over on Hollywood Boulevard, you actually have the international management thing. Um, that is their, their actual location in Hollywood, which is actually middle management. That is not where the actual secret base is. Um, and I'm going to take you there now. So if we kind of go here from LA, I'm now going to take you to the int base or golden era productions. And we'll kind of just fly over there real fast if you don't mind. Uh, so here we go. Zoom. All right. About a two hour drive. We did it in about three seconds. All right. Here is the international base at Gilman Hot Springs, California. This is the location of RTC right up here. That is David Miscavige's super nice little home that he made for himself, his office building that is probably occupied by a, a couple dozen people at most. This big mansion here is what they built for Hubbard thinking he was going to come home. And the actual location of the international management was all in this area right up at the top. This crummy little building right here, this was what uh, has been talked about in a lot of different um, stories that have been shared by international executives, international management executives that have gotten out. This kind of double wide trailer complex is referred to as the whole. At one point, that was where they were actually doing the international um, str strategic planning. And then uh, at some point, all the executives got locked down in there. And then it basically was uh, kind of a, I don't know, it wasn't even the RPF. It was just David Miscavige being really crappy to a lot of people. <clears throat> okay, so you can see this is where a lot of us that were kids, if we had parents that were in the C organization and up at this international management um, base, either Golden Era Productions, which is kind of the southern part, and then they have studios and stuff intermingled with an, uh, the north side of the property. Our parents were here. It's a two hour drive away. So we would be living in Los Angeles virtually by ourselves or kind of tagging along uh, couch surfing with uh, other families. Um, and we maybe saw our parents once a week if they came uh, to visit us. And it was, you know, they'd have to commute down there on Saturday night, see us for an hour or two, and then they'd come back up here. That was the way that the world was working for a while. This is in kind of the uh, the California high desert area. You can see it's a very arid landscape. Um, it's not uh, ugly by any stretch of the imagination, but it's very, very dry in the summertime. It's um, kind of desert conditions in the wintertime. You get a little bit of flooding. That's why you, you can see kind of these washout areas and stuff that happens. So about 20 minutes, if I take you down this road over here, you're going to, about a 20 minute drive, you're going to come to um, an area that is referred to as uh, the Saboba Indian Reservation. It's their, their uh, Native Americans. They actually call themselves the Saboba Indians. And this whole area is owned by the Saboba tribe. Now, you have to travel through this Indian um, 
American Indian Reservation in order to get to a location known as um, the Castile Canyon. This was where the RPF, the location that we just kind of saw that aerial footage of, is right over here. This is about a three mile hike from civilization that you have to travel through the Indian reservation to get to. Um, and you can kind of see this is the area in and around this. It's very, very remote. Um, if you kind of pull out, if you would try to go over these mountains, about the closest thing you're going to find is Palm Springs. That is a very far distance away. And um, there's nothing out here. It is very nicely secluded. A at one point, I think it used to be uh, some sort of resort. And they, uh, the, the Scientologists bought this property. And this is where they had the RPF that was kind of segregated out away for them to go through their reconditioning and they would do manual labor out here and go through their security checking and that whole process. So we could talk for hours and hours and hours about that. But yeah, it's, it's a sparse location. It is uh, like, it's pretty desolate. Now, another thing that's kind of interesting is this is where the children were kept. <laughs> This is where I grew up. So when we were moved out of Los Angeles and moved up here so we can be closer to our parents, this is where we were. Um, and as we were growing up and they established this rehabilitation project force, um, well, this uh, the kids were right here. And then you would have all these RPFers that would be running around doing stuff. And we'd be, you know, kind of seeing them around and they'd be kind of crowded around. They were separate from us, but they were really in the same location. So just kind of looking back at it now, it's a little bit comical to think that they kind of put the people they don't want and the children all in the same spot where it's really hard to get away. All right. So, um, yeah. So here we have that. So when these, um, reporters were starting to do this documentary. They were trying to find out a lot of what was going on. They were going to LA, they were going to the Golden Era Productions property. And when reporters get around, like you can see what they're doing with the protesters, but when it's a news organization, it is a mess. And they flew over this thing with a helicopter um, and Oso was freaking out. Now there's a, an interesting relationship between the Office of Special Affairs and the international base. The Office of Special Affairs, they mainly operate everywhere except certain locations. So the International Base, Church of Spiritual Technology, and some of these upper level organizations, they don't really have jurisdiction there. What you do have is you have the executives like WDC OSA, um, which um, different people have uh, held that job. Uh, for uh, a, a period of time, Mike Rinder was in that position. He was also working in OSA down in Los Angeles. Um, they, there would be this, when, when something happened at this property, it wasn't handled by OSA directly. It would go through a, uh, whichever organizations were up there, their public affairs offices, and they would liaise with certain people in OSA, but it wasn't like OSA just swarming up here. Most, um, most of the time this was kind of handled as kind of a joint operation. Okay. So I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of an orientation. This right here is, this is the actual reservation uh, for these Native Americans. It kind of goes right up to the beginning of this road. As you can see, initial contact I have right here, this is where the, the actual uh, reservation ends. And then as soon as you get onto this other road right here that takes you into this base, that is the property that is owned by Scientology. And that's going to be kind of important as I show you some of this other stuff. You can see down here, I have something marked off as a standoff location. But just giving you an idea, if you wanted to escape here, you would have to walk through this reservation before you got to what looks like normal civilization. Not easy to do. All right. So that is um, the piece there. Now, again, I have the full video linked in the description. So if anyone wants to watch it, it's about 30 minutes long. I'm going to kind of go to some different timestamps and give you some kind of running commentary on what's going on. But at a certain point, these German uh, film crew guys were uh, going out uh, to this location uh, and there was a bit of a standoff that happens. We'll go through this and then towards the end, I'll start, you know, kind of, I'll handle some questions and stuff. If you do have a question, uh, I'll try to, uh, star those, uh, as we go so that I can, uh, keep track of them. Um, but if you have a super chat for sure, I'll be able to get into that. I'll probably just try to focus on this particular thing tonight. I am a little short on time, but I'm excited to, uh, go through all this with you. All right. So let me pull this up. Again, just verify in the chat for me if you can hear this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share this new tab. 
All right, so right here, this is one of our security trucks. Um, and you're going to see this guy, this this gentleman's name is Ken Hoden. He is known as the port captain of Golden Arrow Productions. He is in charge of the public relations in and around that base. And he was kind of the liaison with the OSA stuff um, as it would happen. Uh, and I'll kind of just kind of give some commentary as we're going through this. Um, so this first is them up there in the initial contact point while they're still on the actual reservation property. So here's Ken. Hello. So are you reporters? You a reporter? All right. So listen, yesterday you came onto our property and you said that you weren't a reporter. You weren't here to do a story. You gave a false name. Could you please explain why you did that? Can any of you explain why you did that? Your name is Mr. Reichel, right? We only talked to Mr. David with Kevin. All right. So you yes, said your name was Mr. Your name is Mr. Reichel. You came onto our property. We said to the SNA we only want to talk to Mr. David with Kevin. He said no, so we don't talk. To All right. Mr. All right. Fine. All right, so I'm not going to bore you with all of this interaction, but really what's going to happen here for those who want to go back and watch it, and I'm sorry some of the, the sound uh, is a little bit staticky, but uh, there's some wind and stuff in there. It's kind of the best copy that I have. But here we have Ken Hoden making this initial contact, and he's trying to kind of talk to them. You know, he puts a good face on it and all that, but you can see there's definitely some levels of aggression. Now, this is this is almost comical. What you have is you have this gentleman, which is one of the uh, the film guys. Uh, he was on one of the video teams. His name is Francois, I believe. Um, and he is there. And you're going to see me in this in a little bit, too. But the idea is this like this standoff of cameras like they're filming. So we're going to go and film them. It was like, well, I'm going to film you if you're filming me. And it was this back and forth thing it was supposed to be an intimidation tactic. Not really. Uh, no one's streaming back in the day on this. But it was like we're, that was what you would do when the film crews show up. You get in their face just like they're getting in your face. And you can see we're obviously being as rude as absolutely possible. Um, that is one thing that's very, very true. So um, let me go next to uh, about 724 in the video. All right. Here is some more interactions kind of be going to be important as this kind of starts to get worse. Doing but you all right, see, think you know us. The fact of the matter is, were you truthful with us? Yes or no? Yeah, that's not naturally we are truthful. Were you the truthful? Same truthful all right, you let, me, let me ask this way. Did you come on the property and tell the truth? No, you did what not. You, you did not tell the truth. You came on the property under false pretenses. Not telling the truth. You are you not aren't. telling the truth. You aren't. You no, didn't you tell the truth. You're not telling truth. it now either. No, you are not telling the truth. Okay, thank you. All right. <laughs> okay, so this is now just down the hill <laughs> where you would actually drive up to the property. What is kind of a little bit ironic right here, the guy that's sitting on this tractor, his name is Martin Hubscheid. He's from Germany, but he is he works on this property and he was uh, assigned as part of the ranch um, or the, the the kids part to do uh, the farming and stuff out there. But it was like, well, they can't get on the property if we block it off. So they brought up a backhoe and they were like blocked the road. So they ultimately couldn't get close. Like the fact that they were going there trying to film this RPF after they had trafficked Vipka from Germany there and had this whole thing going on, it was a huge problem. And it was like the bad guys are coming. So they blocked the road here. Anyway, I just think it's kind of funny. Let me go ahead and play it some more. All right, this guy that's getting out, this is a private investigator that is probably um, under, he was, he just showed up. I don't know the guy's name or what, what we were doing, but this guy was right here. Um, he's from or works with Osa and he's, you know, obviously he looks pretty scary and you can see there's this little like face in here with a still camera. Somebody's going to pop out of there. Let's see who it is. Put your camera down, gentlemen. You're on private property. Put right. your... The fact of the matter is, you earlier came on the property. You lied about the fact of who you were. You said you were purely a tourist. In actual fact, I asked you if you were for the media. You were not. You refused. No I have asked you to leave. You will not leave. 
All right, something important to note. You can see what they've done is they've gone down to this little turnabout area. And uh, just to kind of show you again on the map, I'm gonna go back and forth uh, a little bit again. So on this map, this is where we were in that original piece. And right now what they've done is they've gone down this little hill right here, and they've gone to this turnaround portion. This is on Scientology's property right here. As you're going to see this escalate, but this is exactly what they were hoping would happen because at this, because they do have a no trespassing or private property sign posted somewhere around here that the Indians would shoot at constantly and it had a bunch of bullet holes and stuff in it. But as soon as you're past this little point on the road, you're on their property and you're going to see how this ends up shaking out with Ken. I have asked you to leave. I have informed you that this is private property and you have not left. I don't believe it to be private property. All right. The gentleman there says he does not believe that it's private property. The fact of the matter is this is private property. These gentlemen are from Germany. They're not American citizens. They will not abide by the law in America. I am asking you to leave. You're on private property. What you did today was you endangered the children's lives at that school by flying at 175 feet over the property in a helicopter. You know that it's illegal. You know that the FAA says the limit is 500 feet and that's it. So you're I'm giving you one last leave. warning. Are you going to leave? Yes or no? Fine. I'm placing you under citizen's arrest right now. Why are you so crying? That's no reason why. So this, this Wow. That escalated quickly. Um, but you can see as Ken turns away, he he's kind of like, you know, he's a PR guy. He's constantly smiling even when he's not. So you can see how this thing is just getting uh, like worse and worse. Now, as you probably noticed, that guy in the background, that was me. Um, I was there with a still crammer running around part of the intimidation crew. And you're going to see how this uh, slowly gets a little bit worse and a little bit worse. So as soon as he says that, they basically decide like, okay, well, we're going to go ahead and try to leave. And let's see what then happens at that point. Um, let me see, just going to go a little bit here forward. Okay, great. I want to leave and what you're saying and what you're doing is you're blocking the, so you're blocking the road. We have it on camera, you're the blocking the road. I'm going to start out with this. Please, you can explain your story to them. They're very fair. They'll do what's right. The fact of the matter is that when I was up there on the property before you came, I said, can you go on a tour? I said, no, you cannot go on a tour. So then you drive onto our property. You come onto our property and say, you must leave. You don't leave, you photograph. Now you can talk to the police officer. I literally step in front of their car and keep them from leaving. You know, this is, in my mind here, this was like, we got the bad guys. We, we, we caught them doing their thing. This is the proof we're filming this. He said that he's gonna place them under citizen's arrest. Like I know anything about what that might even mean, but, but look at the level of fanaticism that I had at this time. This was crazy. Like this guy was trying to drive. I stood right in front of him. I am standing right here in this guy's way. All right. So this just goes on like this for quite a while. So when, as soon as Ken said, I'm placing you under citizen's arrest or whatever he said, at some point we're all on, we all have radios and we have these walkie talkies and everyone's staying in contact. There's a bunch of additional people back uh, by this um, piece of uh, machinery back here. And one of the security guards ended up calling um, the police from a landline. There weren't many cell phones at this point. So he called the police and the police have to drive from either Hemet or San Jacinto all the way um, out here. Yeah. People are saying you look like a good photographer. <laughs> That wasn't my camera. They like, here, there's this camera. And I'm like, oh, this looks like fun. This is not a digital camera, by the way. So you saw me at one point running back and forth. I had to get more film. Like this is an actual like camera camera, uh, like the real deal. So here I am doing this thing. And uh, the, now the police have been called and they're uh, then having to drive out through the reservation to get to this point. And let's go ahead and go forward to about uh, the 1545 mark and uh, see what's going on there. All right, and I think this is going to be um, Ina doing some talking. Go ahead and let her speak for a minute. So that's a public road coming up from um, Gilman Hot Springs, where the headquarter is located. On the left side, there's a big public uh, golf court, and on the right side near the mountains, there are some other buildings. They say they are administration houses. And this uh, road, I think it's called uh, Dings. How, how does it called? Castle Canyon Road, right? It goes up to, into the mountains and 
at the end of the road there is a, a camp, a kind of school they told us. Uh, other people say it's not only a school, it's a kind of concentration camp where they are arrested, where they were arrested. And there are a lot of people who told what happened there, what happened with the people. And there's a man called Taba Yoyo and he was... Um, all right, so what she is starting to talk about in here, she's like, you know, kind of going over what I had mentioned, but she said a very interesting name in here, Tabioyan. There was a gentleman by the name of Andre Tabioyan. He actually worked for Hubbard and he worked very closely with Miscavige. At one point, Andre decided to leave and he left with his wife. Now, he had a son who was working in Golden Era Productions, who was a friend of mine, uh, who was um, still stayed back. Uh, and didn't leave. And there was a whole campaign to keep the son from the father. His son was made to change his name to something completely different. And they moved him around and away so that his father and mother could not find him. Andre Tabioyan was a former, I think, force recon Marine in Vietnam. Like he's the real deal. Like he was not somebody to be trifled with. And he was very upset about all of the crap that was going on with his son. So there was a plan that was hatched by certain executives, David Miscavige being one of them. Um, and um, I'm more than certain that Mike Rinder was intimately involved with this with Casavius. Um, which is the, the son's name in order to hide him from his father. And they made him change his name completely. And they ended up sending him to different countries, similar to what was going on with Vipka, just out of spite. So this is the kind of crap that we were involved in at the time. And it was nasty. So as Andre's speaking to, you know, people, uh, the word got out that Casavius is probably at this location. He was there at this time during these, this times he was being kept there and he was made to work there, um, in this really weird situation. He was, uh, a child in Scientology that grew up, uh, in the, in this, um, Hollywood location. He was, you know, not cared for properly, um, similar to a lot of the kids in this situation. And then now as a, uh, an older teenager and young adult, he's now put out here to be put in charge of taking care of kids. Not something that he was probably qualified to do, nor probably that even wanted to do. And um, Laura uh, FM and I talked a little bit in one of our talks, and he was one of the names that came up, Casavius. So she's talking about this, but if you, if you kind of dissect all these things going on, they were not wrong in what they were doing. They were looking for people that were legitimately being hidden and missing. And that was what was going on at this point. So she um, continues to talk a little bit more. She's kind of dialoguing. Everyone's waiting for the cops to show up at this point. Uh, I'm going to go forward to, let's see, about the 24 minute mark, uh, which is when the police actually show up. Now, I couldn't tell you if the police um, were called right when they showed up at the top uh, at the initial contact portion or once um, Hoden, you know, kind of did the citizens arrest uh, shenanigans or not. But um, here, let me go forward. Let's see, 2440. All right, let me go about here. You can see me back in the wood, back in the bushes here. I'm trying to get all these really great shots. Like it really is uh, super, super important. All right. So now standing in front of this vehicle, this is a guy named Bruce Wagner. Bruce Wagner was the uh, legal director underneath Ken Hoden, basically Ken Hoden's immediate junior, uh, while this PI is just kind of sitting there probably being paid super well by OSA. Um, but but this is another Sea Org member, probably not too dissimilar from me, uh, working in Golden Era Productions. And Bruce and I, during this entire thing, would actually be in the cars together, like following these guys around as they would go from location to location, filming them as they're filming us. It was a very sp you know, spy versus spy kind of cheesy. But um, now he's standing in front of this car and the cops are about to show up. Here are trespassers on our property. Mr. Hoden over here is the, um, so here I come rolling up, like I'm about to tell this cop, uh, the way that's going. The first thing he does is like, Hey, stop talking. Why don't you like, like, who are you get away from me? And, um, anyway, I just thought it's, it's interesting to look at this, just the, the, uh, the level of arrogance that I had in this situation and how right we thought we were, it's just worth mentioning. So let me just let the cop talk for a bit. Are we looking? Are Mr. Collins? No, I'm not. Who's Mike Collins? Um, he's a security guard at the property where well, the children are. Bring him down here. I need to speak to him. Okay, right. good. Yeah, I'll radio him right now, sir. All right. Okay. Hey, all these folks like ABC. We're to together. Hang on, hang on. Hi. Right. Your folks are over here for a minute. 
Okay. Um, I will spare everybody the gory details, but uh, what you basically have is a cop trying to sort out a bunch of, uh, you know, stuff between uh, Peter Ken Hoden and he's trying to he first thing he did is like let's separate everybody out and, and he just starts you know kind of trying to work through this all ultimately he was like hey you guys want to go get out of their way let them go they left um I don't know if there were charges that were actually filed on this or not um but this is what was so um remarkable about this we we thought when the cops came that they were going to like drag them off in handcuffs or something that is not what happened exactly like not even close um so you can this whole interaction I thought would be important to go over because this is um, me working at this property and me intimately connected with uh, a bunch of um, bad acts against this German film crew that at the time I thought I was doing the right thing, but I was very, very much not doing the right thing. I was on the wrong side of this uh, for sure. So um, anyway, Again, in the descriptions below, there is uh, plenty of, um, there's the links you can get into, like go in, like look at all of it. I would highly recommend everyone go and check out uh, Peter's channel. I think it's uh, right down in German news, German news. Um, you know, he doesn't have that many subscribers. I know that they did this stuff back in the day. Peter and I have been um, kind of corresponding back and forth just over email. And he had a lot of questions about stuff. And some of the questions are, you know, ultimately what ended up happening to uh, to Vipka? Like, what? where did she go? Like, where, where was she during all of this whole thing? Um, and that is a very good question. Like, let me just go ahead and share her photo again. This is, uh, again, in their documentary. So Vipka Hansen. Um, what happened to Vipka? She was on this rehabilitation project force for a long, long time. Once she graduated the rehabilitation project force, they then, now she went through this whole thing, had her do the estates project force. Um, and then they posted her at Golden Era Productions. And if we kind of go back out again, she then went and started working at the international base. That's about a 15 minute drive away right down here. And she was placed uh, in uh, a made a Sea Org member at this international base. Um, and she then was, she was a very accomplished artist, very, very talented. So she worked on sets and props for many, many years. And it makes me wonder why on earth would they want to keep her there? Aside from the fact that she kind of was doing the exact same stuff that Scientology tends to do with their money, uh, but she was doing it to them. And it's super bad PR. Add to that the fact that the German government, um, probably the financial irregularities that would be uh, associated with this entire uh, thing would uh, be even more of a hit on Scientology's already tarnished and crappy reputation in Germany. So um, yeah, to my knowledge, she very possibly is still working at this location uh, at, in uh, the cinematography unit. Um, anyone that's uh, friends with Mitch Brisker, you can ask him uh, what it was like to work with Vipka because I'm sure he worked with Vipka for a number of years and would know a lot about um, her and her talent and what she was actually um, done in her employment when she was working here with all of the other staff. Anyway, that is uh, kind of the the nuts and bolts of that whole thing. Um, I will try to take a few of the uh, the chats. Let me just, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing this. All right, let me get back up into here and see what's going on. Lathanda, uh, seeing this old COS building in the beginning of the documentary reminds me that they had to move to a much smaller building years after that. It's very interesting. I really don't know what happened with kind of the fallout of the whole you know, Vipka um, thing that was going on, but um, it very interesting. I wonder, because they were supposed to go and fix it, was part of that fix to move them to a building that they could actually uh, afford? I know that if anyone just wants to look at uh, what the facility looks like now, if you just go on a Google Earth or a Google Maps and then search uh, Church of Scientology of Hamburg, you will see it looks like a fairly nice building that is there now. So um, I don't know much about the current state of things uh, other than just kind of what I see about other organizations that don't look like they're doing super great. Thank you, um, Lathanda. 
All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Valkyrie 24, was there a no trespass posted? There was. I In the video, you can actually see it in there. And I kind of mentioned it was kind of shot up by the Indians. They weren't super happy that we were there. So we were friendly with some of them, but some of them we were definitely not. Um, thank you. Let's see. Uh, Tazzy D, is uh, Ken in ch still in charge of anything? His uh, <laughs> Kennergy is so bullying. So he was uh, up at this, he was uh, at this location for a very, very long time. And then he was sent to that PAC rehabilitation project force. And he was actually on the RPF with my mother, um, Rosemary, uh, for many, many years. And I don't know what ended up happening with him, if he is still there or if he is not. But um, I hope he got out, as I hope that everyone eventually gets out. Um, Ken was married uh, to a lady named uh, Lisa. Uh, she was one of the singers in Golden Era Productions for a while and then was one of their executives. So, um, yeah. Let me pull this up. Let's see. And Sillery, do you recognize the name uh, Nina from your time at the Cadet Org? Uh, she is still in the Sea Org, but in Kansas City. I do not know, but uh, in Kansas City, who might know is Reese, uh, Relatable Reese. Uh, she That is her stomping ground. She very, very likely does know that name. So give Reese a shout in one of her uh, videos, and I'm sure she can help you with that. Let me just see if there's any other questions. Uh, let's see. We have a comment. I haven't really looked at it yet. Comment. Mitch talked uh, a lot about her when he first came out on YouTube. Uh, he had a hand painted background made by her. There are probably a million teeny dots on it. Yeah. So I remember she was very, very good as an artist uh, and they would use her to make these big murals. Um, so um, her her calling as an artist, it can't be understated. She was impressive to watch. Um, I just wish that she was uh, in a better situation where she would be appreciated for what she was doing. Let's see, Janet uh, questioned, did many journalists attempt to infiltrate or get photos, videos from helicopters? Not that I remember. This was kind of, I think, a unique circumstance that really scared the crap out of them, to be honest. And I didn't, I don't think they knew very um, well how to deal with that. So the whole, you know, like you flew over our property. Um, so the, the, there is a 500 foot hard deck ceiling that the FAA does have for uh, civil aviation. Helicopters are allowed to go under that. I would know because I'm a helicopter instructor pilot, but you also have to be cognizant of what you're flying over. So you could make the argument that flying over a school, flying over private property at a low altitude, if you were doing that, uh, could be uh, construed as um, not acceptable. But again, helicopters have uh, much more ability to maneuver than airplanes do. And that 500 feet is uh, definitely an airplane restriction, but helicopters, as they, co they come in and land all and pretty much anywhere. So it's not really that big of a deal for them. All right, we'll, we'll have a couple more. Uh, let's see, uh, popsicle people. How old would she be by now? Shoot. So um, I guess at this time, she was probably what when uh, back in uh, 95, they said she was 51. So you kind of do the math. She was probably getting uh, definitely up there. She was probably about my mom's age. So she'd be in her 70s, at least. I'm doing math in public. So it's that's not my strong suit. I don't know if you know this, but I grew up at that ranch and they didn't they didn't teach me very well. So um, <laughs> not great at math. All right. Let me see. Um, nuts and board. Uh, whatever happened to the boy um, forced to change his name? Um, so he is out. Um, he was, uh, he has his own very unique story and I hope that he's going to be in a position to uh, be able to talk about it more. Um, he was a very, uh, important part of a lot of people's lives. Um, I respect him very much. He's a father. Um, he's married. To, he actually was able to stay with his wife in this location and he has a very, very interesting story. He's, uh, he was very traumatized by all of it from my understanding and is uh, looking to get past a lot of that and is uh, looking to get some counseling and working through it. So I don't really want to uh, go too much into that because I think that that's probably his story to share. And I hope at some point um, we can talk more about it because um, it's very, very unique. Let's see. Question. Um, why do some Sea people get out uh, owning property and have uh, outside jobs versus Rosemary circumstances? So you're going to have civilian Scientologists who come in and they are actually like parishioners. They come in and receive Scientology services. And then you're going to have those civilian staff members that are at those class five organizations. And most of the time they have a spouse that's in the normal real world that uh, works and they own property and all that. And they usually sign five-year contracts, um, two and a, 
I believe it's two and a half or five year contracts. Uh, and then they kind of keep re-upping those where they do their time and then they get out. And then you have the C organization members that um, are almost like the inner clergy uh, for the Catholic Church. They do not have property. They live communally. Uh, they're not allowed to uh, really own anything. Um, they're made to sell everything off and they get paid less than $50 a week. So my mother was in the circumstance of being one of these C organization members. And then when she became elderly, they started taking her money from her. So you know, some of these people, as they get out and they make their life again, if you get out soon enough, like I did, I left when I was about 27, I was able to make a life for myself. So that's why I, you know, have a somewhat normal looking life, even though I have all this kind of baggage that I have to unpack and, you know, things to kind of weed through as a lot of people are doing. Um, so for those C organization members that got out soon enough, they're able to make a life for themselves. In my mother's situation, she didn't leave until she was in her late seventies with nothing. So at that point, you can't even work. So she's on Social Security and just has a small pension. There's not a whole lot to that. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. It's a good one. All right. Let's just uh, take a look here. Uh, let's see. Lathanda. Uh, uh, Grocklinger. Grocklinger. I'm probably a um, proud uh, flea board warrior. I walk by Hamburg Org weekly and it's not in good shape. It's empty and the whole thing looks like a corpse on life support. They have to pay property tax over here and the location is expensive. That is uh, very good information. So I think that this is this is a good thing to highlight, Lathanda. I appreciate you bringing it up. The only reason why you're seeing all this stuff that's going on where Scientology looks like they're somewhat functional in the United States is because they're tax exempt status. You have these big whales, these very rich people that are, you know, um, that are wined and dined in Scientology that have these big companies that have to have tax write-offs or the, they are independently wealthy on their own and they're, tr they need to have something to put, uh, get rid of some of their tax burden so they can move around in tax brackets. It's, it's just the way rich, like money creates problems. The more money you have, you then have to manage that money because people, uh, because the tax exemption in the United States, you have these whales that continue to contribute to Scientology because they can use it as a tax write-off. If you got rid of that, the same thing that's happening in Hamburg would start to become true in every Scientology organization, and they would slowly dwindle down to nothing. All right, uh, Chicago Scientology audit. Um, let's see, question. How can you find out what uh, class uh, your local org is? So your local org in Chicago, pretty much everything except for the uh, few C organization bases are all going to be class five orgs. And out of those class five orgs, you might have smaller missions uh, that kind of feed up into those class five orgs. So if you the one in Chicago, that's a class five org. Um, you then have the stuff in Clearwater, Florida, or the stuff that's in uh, Los Angeles, California. Those are C organization bases where the upper levels are delivered. So any where that is other than a few continental locations of which there's probably seven, maybe eight of these things, everything else is the class five organizations. And um, those are the ones that, you know, we need to start um, making our presence known at in, in my estimation. All right, Tracy and Tulsa question, were you in Afghanistan in 2012 um, when those, um, let's see, uh, I was in Afghanistan in 2000, uh, 2011, 2010, 2011, I uh, left Afghanistan in probably September of uh, 2011. I then went back multiple times again in 13, 14, and then in 18, uh, 19 as well. So I've been to Afghanistan three times. I've been to Iraq twice, um, but I was uh, done, definitely done some time in both of these locations. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, let's see. Question. Uh, when your mom was in the RPF, uh, where were you based? Okay, so when she was in the RPF, I was um, probably in Fort Drum, New York, or in Southern Alabama at the training base that the Army has down there. Uh, it was Fort Rucker, Alabama. They've renamed it to Novacell. Um, and Mike Novacell, actually, I, I like that renaming. Uh, Mike Novacell was uh, an absolutely amazing warrant officer and a Medal of Honor recipient. So uh, it's worth, if you're into military history and base names and stuff, take a look at that. But yeah, between, um, that would be between... Um, upper uh northern new york and southern alabama about as far as you can get either north or south of one another all right just taking a look here let's see i watched the videos this morning and made me very angry and sad that she was never reunited with her family yes i completely totally agree um absolutely let me see just gonna take and just verify some of the questions here um and 
just going to kind of, I'm going to take this one more comment and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, I really do appreciate everyone tuning in tonight. Question, uh, comment. I believe Amy Scobie talked a little bit about that guy uh, with a changed name. I believe she said he was sent to South Africa. I'm not sure what video she talked about about him though. I'm not sure. I know that he, I think he was sent to Europe if I'm not mistaken. Um, but yeah, he, his life was definitely turned upside down just out of spite. Uh, so if you want to talk about somebody that's life was absolutely crushed, um, there is a story there and, uh, there's some answers that need to come from that because it's, uh, it's pretty bad. Anyway, that is my story for tonight. Um, I hope I did a fairly decent job of kind of painting the picture of, uh, what happened and also the mindset that I was in and um, kind of because I, I really do feel like this was me being involved in some bad deeds. So um, I thought it would be interesting to talk about. Um, there's probably plenty more that I can talk about and will do in the future, but I hope that at least everyone found it somewhat entertaining. And again, thank you for tuning in. Uh, I'm going to use my outro tonight. So I leave you with Tom. Everyone have a great evening. Being a Scientologist, when you drive past an accident, it's not like anyone else. As you drive past, you know you have to do something about it because you know you're the only one that can really help. We were in the middle of our tournament where my friend John said he found a body in the bushes over there. I ran over there because I'm a healing monk to try and help, but obviously my magic wasn't strong enough because the dude's body was missing a head. He or she has the ability to create new and better realities and improve conditions. So my friend decided to try and use a necromancer spell, which didn't work, which I knew it wouldn't. Uh, being Scientologist, you look at someone and you know absolutely that you can help them. And apparently we contaminated the crime scene because that spell uses a lot of glitter. I think it's a privilege to call yourself a Scientologist and it's something that you have to earn. And because Scientologist does 